to the second lecture of Kishan Galatia. Thank you, Lena. And uh, glad to see most people are still here. So <laughs> obviously, I uh, found some of what I said interesting. Right, so let's, let's, let's power. What I'm going to do now is give you a little bit more nitty gritty um, into two things. I'm, I'm slide, a few slides behind. So the first thing is, I can exert a peak of Newton force, but how am I turning it into a measuring apparatus? So here's the, here's the number of the matter. Whatever I wish to do in biology, medicine, or physics, I would like to measure a small displacement. I would like to measure a small force on a single molecule. I might wish to measure a single molecular event, for example, ATP to ADP for conversion of phosphate. To do that, it's no good just saying, oh, I'm, I think I'm getting around a peak of Newton force and doing that. Let me give, let me give you an analogy. Um, Australia is a very big club place, right? If you're going on a long drive, say up the Gold Coast or the Sunshine Coast, you've got to check your car. You've got to check your tyre pressures, and you may want to check your wheels, right? um, you know, especially with you know, on your car. And you need a torque wrench, but you don't just say, oh, that's pretty tight, I'll do. People, car manufacturers, give you a little dial to, to tighten it up to a certain number, right? They, they have a calibrated torque. I don't know if you want to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. Translates to you. Okay, so if we add that number, you might be a little unclear whether you've over, you know, over tightened bolts, you can under tighten them. Very important, it could make a difference between life and death on a long distance drive, right? In the same way here, this isn't life and death, but it certainly is very important that we turn this from an ad hoc, here's a few peak and newtons, here's a bit of a distance, to something where we say, right, I saw that that molecule moved this distance and it exerted that force doing that reaction. That's the sort of level of detail we want. And then we can hopefully transpose those concepts into the colloidal and the atomic domain if we wish. So the question is, how do I now go to a precise measurement apparatus? Okay. Right, so in fact, optical tweezers, as we see, is a sense of blessing in disguise. And the reason is, it is essentially probably the most beautiful example of a microscopic hooky and spring. That's the nub of what the next few slides in. Right, Hooke's law. Force is proportional to displacement. Pretty simple. That very concept is exploited in optical tweezers and used by every single person looking at biophysics. Let's see how we do that. So that's one of the key points here. The other point is optical tweezers can measure and strong level, level resolution with an optical wavelength. Now that might sound like a very silly thing to say. Now, an angstrom is a pretty small number. I think there's a couple of labs around the world that can measure the equivalent of a displacement of the Bohr radius. Now that's an amazing thing. It's not a number that you normally associate with photonics at a microscopic scale. All right? And the number of why we can do that because you'll say, well, hold on, that must be rubbish, because we've got an optical wavelength, we've got a microscope, how are we going to ever measure an angstrom? The point is, the particle stays in the middle, and what we can do is measure the center of gravity of the particle using fast electronics and position sensing, okay, and we can determine where the center of the object is to a far higher precision than the optical wavelength. You can go around and make a basic optical tweezers within a month, that will measure nanometric precision. Okay, that's pretty impressive. As that starts to get into the realms of looking at single molecule biophysics, etc. and so on. So, how do we understand this? So, this is just a simple way of doing it. This is from a, um, a, a colleague at Yale University who's very much into colloidal physics, Eric Dufresne, who worked in the group of uh, David Greer, who's now in New York as well, two famous people in this field. And what they're doing here is they just say, I put the particle in the trap, and I get a detector, and I just watch what the particle does over time. Okay? I'm just doing that. I just measure the center of gravity of the position, and they plot it. That's the sort of distance. Look at the numbers, nanometers. That's what they get. Okay? It just tells you the number of event times it's actually here to here. Okay? Just a frequency plot. Pretty simple. So that's a histogram of a particle position. The probability of displacement, though, for this system follows a standard Boltzmann law. And that's the Boltzmann.
spectrum distribution there. All right? Now, we know T because I could put my little chamber in an incubator or I could have it nicely stabilized pretty easily. All right? I know Boltzmann's constant. And so by feeling this, I can find out the optical potential. All right? If I know the potential, the force is the gradient of the potential in a given form. Okay? Oops. We can extract the shape of the ball. In other words, the particles in the little ball. It's like me. I'm, I'm, I'm trapped to a big beam, and the beam's sort of maybe beyond the realm of that wall, and I'm sort of sitting here, but I'm jiggling around a little bit, all right? But I, I, I move as if I'm in a little ball. Okay? And if you extract the shape of the potential well, you find it is a parabola. Now, parabolas are wonderful things in physics. And when physicists smile when they see parabolas. And parabolas, if the potential is parabolic and the force is del the potential, you can see the force is linearly proportional to this place. Okay? So basically, that's what happens. A very relatively small displacements, and that's fine because that's what we're interested in when we're doing single molecule stuff. We have a potential well that allows us to measure displacements. Um, in such a way that it's a hooky in spring. So, if I can calibrate this, and what I mean calibrate, what's the unknown? It's kappa. Alright? If I can know what kappa is, and then I do some physics, I can then work out, for any displacement, what force is exerted. So, if a molecule moves 2 nanometers, I can actually infer what force is exerted for my given track. I'm sorry, I said something. How are you measuring these small displacements? Right, so I'll show you a little bit. A photo detector. Typically, it's using a quadrant photodiode. It's a four-segment detector based on silicon, which has, um, well, basically, you image the particle onto the detector, and by either carefully summing and subtracting the quadrants, I'll show you this in a future slide, you do that. Okay? But the idea is that we can measure these displacements very accurately. Particle tracking actually has gone on, has come on leaps and bounds, and many manufacturers do incredible particle tracking apparatus. We have somebody coming around now and doing that. It's a beautiful microscope. So particle tracking has become a very exciting and big area in itself. Um, and certainly for this field, it's very, very important. It's quadrant photodiodes, fast bandwidth, very, very good. Now, it's also very, very important to note the next piece of science that helps in our favor in some sense, though it's not the only where, place where tweezers is used, is this overdamped. Okay, so this is a harmonic oscillator, all right? And so I, I could have put it on lots of maths, but I decided not to. I've got m x double dot, right? Everybody's done a course in oscillations and waves or something at some point, probably. So, amazingly, all of physics is oscillations. You know, when I did that course, my, my, my lecturer said, Kishan, you better remember this course. It's really important to you know, all of physics. But I thought, you're talking a load of rubbish about that. <laughs> it wasn't too far off from what I did now. Very important course. All right, critical down, under down, over down, oscillation. More or less, not so much physics can be described by this, this beautiful sets of equations. Right, we've got mx double dot. Then we've got some other term in the middle, which is something like gamma with an x dot, which is velocity. Remember, that's the damping. Right, then we've got a linear term. Basically, optical tweezers um, would normally, in air, all right, or in vacuum, would be under down. There's no damping mechanism, right? Air. However, when you put them in liquid, it's rather like uh, perhaps me in a swimming pool or something, right? If um, it's overdamped, okay? In other words, the, the damping is so strong, it overwhelms the natural frequency. If you were put in the numbers for a one micron bead, the natural trap frequency will be something like 50 kilohertz. You can see here, if you measure the power spectrum from that, the position oscillations, the frequency falls off at one kilohertz, which is really low. After that, everything else is gone. It's really highly overdone. And that's cool, because the damping helps. It helps localize the particle, coral. So we saw the nanoparticles still whizzing around the bottom block earlier on. And that damping actually helps us. So now we can, what we'll find is that it's so overdone, inertia drifts drop. So I can get rid of that MX double block. It's actually very, very small if you put the numbers in, right? And you only get thermal oscillation. So that's the only equation that we want, all right? And if you do that, and then you put in 
the numbers here for the, and do a Fourier transform of the fluctuations, we can get extract what's called a power spectrum. In other words, what are the fluctuations at any given frequency occurring for this particle? And then you get what's called a corner frequency from which you can extract the trap stiffness. In other words, how stiff is your trap? How stiff is your key and spring? And this is the beauty of optical trapping because everybody can go home and do this very, very straightforwardly with a photodiode, calibrate their trap, and then say, I know for a given power what the trap stiffness is for your system. Of course, it will vary from lab to lab because everybody uses a slightly different objective, slightly different optics, slightly different laser beam, etc. And you can go home and calibrate it, and then once it's calibrated, just like tightening the nuts on your, on your uh, cartwheel, you can then attach molecules, you can, do, you can now say, right, let's do some physics. Let's make the bead um, be perturbed in some way due to some external force, and then see what happens. What happens in the close proximity of a glass slide? Incredibly, there are hydrodynamics coming in and things can change there. What happens if a molecule is attacked? What if another bead comes in? What if? Dot, dot, dot. You, you pick the experiment. But the beauty is that this can actually be measured so well that we can actually now start to do amazing physics with it. Going back to the question you've just asked, that is, how do we measure that? There are a number of ways. Now, in fact, one of the emerging areas I won't talk too much about is fast cameras, people we, we, um, which are going to be very useful in the future. And fast cameras, now what is fast in this world? Thankfully, the overdamping means that I've got to get above a kilohertz. If you look at what's called the Nyquist criteria, in other words, say typically I want to get twice as fast as the fastest frequency I'd ever want to measure, I'd need a camera that could probably do two kilohertz or better. Incredibly now, for a few thousand dollars, or less, Australian dollars, I guess, yeah. Oh, for 700 pounds in the UK, which is, what, 1,500 Australian dollars, maybe two to one, I don't know. All right, you can buy a decent camera that can do it. Now, cameras aren't, and of course, with the cameras, of course, if you reduce the fuel, you can get by the fastest rate you can on the CCD. If you want to get lots of particles, you might have to buy a bit more. Anyway, that is emerging, and is not yet widely used. However, silicon photodiodes have wild relative to what we want to do, and here this is how you can measure it. For example, if I want to measure X and Y, I image my particle with some lenses onto here. And so that, if I just, with a bit of electronics, do that, I'll be able to say which way it's going that way. And with this interferometric force detection, by looking at the beam going through the scattered beam, I can actually measure the in and out. And this is actually very nice, and a lot of detail on this is, for example, given by Christoph Schmidt's group in the Netherlands here. So incredibly, the capture rate is very, very fast. There's issues about where the gain occurs in silicon photodiodes in the infrared, and they, you can get some spurious effects there. If you look at Kirsten Berg Sorensen's group, so those of you who there's too much about for this, this point, but you have to be a little careful when you're looking. But generally, you can get nanometer scale by the center of gravity idea and measure things incredibly well. And that's the number of it. So a lot of physics and, and, and criteria have conspired to help us very nicely to do things. What would you then measure? So here, for example, uh, if you want to read more about the, uh, the big technique, look at this paper from the group in Denmark. This is from adapted from uh, Justin and Lauren Miles Padgett's review paper. This work I've been done in the north of London by colleagues of Justin and Lauren. So here, basically, they just measure where the position of particles is, okay? All right, remember that histogram? It just zings up and down. Da, 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 da. They can build up a histogram. That's how we got our potential. And then, by doing the Fourier transform, we get the Lorentzian spectrum, and you can find out all the frequencies. Again, please note how quickly it falls off, which allows us very easily to use our fast um, photodiodes to actually measure things. So now, we can calibrate a trap we can measure things with no force and its displacement, and so now we can really tighten up the wheels of our car and actually do some very nice measurements. Okay, with a single trap, what can you do? Just one bead in a trap. Now, I won't put the word molecules up, and the first thing to note is people don't typically trap molecules directly. Alina had, she then done a paper here, I think, a little while ago. I think Ruby Cambridge has done some work on this, maybe some others. 
So I apologize for these other groups of disservice. But anybody, why don't we why won't that we track molecules directly typically? Any ideas? From what I've said in the last hour and ten minutes. I've given you the answer a couple of times. What did I say about when things get small? Why is it harder to track? <coughs> Brilliant. Polarizability, right? So typically, if I take a large bead of one micron and I go down to 100 nanometers, that's a factor of 1,000 in polarizability typically. Right? So molecules are pretty small, all right? And who knows what direction the molecule might line up in, etc. So typically, we do not, we do not trap molecules directly to do the single molecule biopsy. What do we do then? We do the following. We use surface chemistry to attach the molecule of interest to our bead, which then acts like a little cargo carrier. All right? So here's kinesin, which is motion on a microtubule, which some of you will know moves in typically eight nanometer steps. Okay. All right. And here they can do. I mean, this is one or two convincing to you, but while this is very convincing, uh, <laughs> all the spectral analysis of this. So here's the idea. You do that. So biotin streptavidin attaches the molecule. Then you lay down on your glass slide, say, some microtubule tracks. All right. Kinesis is very well known to carry chromosomes and other things around. And you can measure eight nanometer steps and look at the look at what happens if you deplete or or, or do things to the the, the buffer medium, for example. That's one way of doing things. Eight nanometers. Now, that's what you can do with a single trap. So just a single trap, photodiode, you can do your kinesic work. Now this has already been done. However, there's a lot of other molecules that are uh, more interesting. In other words, looking at DNA, acting myosin, etc. How do we study those? Well, we need to go further. Now, I'm going to show you why we might need two traps or more. Okay, so here's, that's probably time for another video. So this is a single piece of DNA tied in a knot. So this is what's called lambda phase DNA, which you can find in shops, basically. Uh, the catalogue is stained, so it illuminated with a mercury lamp. Now, they're not the first group to tie a DNA in a knot. There's a group in Japan, and uh, this is just a nice video I found. This is Stephen Quaid's group, who's a Caltech, and they're looking at the physics of knots, which is interesting in itself. Now, here, what, now of course you can't tie DNA in a knot if I've just got one bead and the DNA dangling. That's going to be pretty hard. I'm going to have a lot of trouble. All right? So obviously you do need to do the gravity check. So that's the first thing. And that's important also for actin myosin, where, for example, you have a myosin actin molecule and you cover myosin B that sort of gently strokes the actin as it moves. Why, just as I the sign, why is he interested in this? Basically, all the DNA in our cells is being knotted and unknotted all the time. It's just a natural part of being alive. But what actually um, they were looking at was this process, and these enzymes known as top isomerases that basically help untie the knots in our cells. And they were looking basically at getting cancer cells tied in knots, depleting them with the top isomerases so they kill themselves. Now, the way a cell dies matters, if you ask your biologists. All right? It's, you know, necrosis, lysis. Apoptosis. So the way a cell dies can affect its nearest neighbors, etc. So there they were trying to deplete cells and kill them by um, um, depriving of this and then looking at this knotting process. Okay, that was, I think, a sort of loose uh, reason just to have some fun with the physics and the knots. But it just shows you one example of what you might want to do. And for those of you interested, please have a look at this paper and the references there. So for those of you who are really interested in this field, um, there's a lot of reviews. One that I particularly like is from Tom Perkins, who's actually at Ryband Institute, I think, uh, who's, uh, uh, who's, I think, worked with Stephen Block and is doing some very, very exciting thing. This is an incredibly clear and um, very well-written review. I can give you a full reference if you want, but you'll find it. Um, and he discusses all the, there's the idea of um, how the traps are done, etc. And, and how we look here, for example, at twisting DNA. And people can measure things like Young's modulus, torsional moduli, etc., using this technique. Just to show you one of the, this is probably not, this experiment has been repeated with different guises. Uh, is, but I just thought this was a tour de force experiment from Stephen Block's lab, for some of you interested. 
So many of you, some of you, know, some of you've done no biology, you probably know a lot more biology than I do. So transcription and transcribing things is basically central dogma of biology. Imagine now watching this in real time on a single molecule. That's exactly what we did. This is base pair stepping at 3.7 angstroms, looking at transcription of RNA polymerase. Okay, along with, progressively along the DNA template to create complementary RNA. Watching on a single molecule. This is done with optical freedom. The experiment was um, has a lot of detail which I won't go into. They use a dual trap, again that shows the reason for two traps. There's the RNA being created. And here what they do is they exert a constant force. Instead of force proportional to displacement, they wanted to exert constant force all the time to keep it under constant tension. So they displaced it, and that's our force versus distance. Look at that linearity, or F equals minus Kx. And if they displace the trap, they can put it basically at this turning point where the force is constant, but for minor displacement, which is really all you're seeing here, basically the force changes negligibly. The big thing that they did, and you can do it in other ways now, because the Stamante group, I think, is in a different way, these guys wanted to create um, an ultra-stable trap. Now the meters was not good enough. How do you create ultra-stable? They bought the best laser. They bought the optics in the basement. They got the university to fund a big concrete slab under it, etc. Still wasn't good enough. So what they did was they filled the whole box with helium. Now why on earth would you do that? The refractive index of helium is very close to unity. So rather like a star twinkling, incredibly, the, the, the variation of the laser beam just going through the air in the free space optics made a difference. So to remove that, what they did was they actually looked at that, and here in part B you can see the integrated noise with air and helium here. Okay? And so they showed a tenfold reduction in the power spectrum. So this is rather like the twinkling of the star. Even if you buy the best laser, you've still got to go through air. Incredibly. So anyway, so if you want to go and repeat that, these are about three or four labs I think in the world at least now to do things like this, but very exciting stuff but also quite challenging uh, in engineering wise. So let me, for about 20, 30 minutes, go into to 15 minutes, uh, <coughs> go into <laughs> looking at multiple traps and structured fields. So this will lay a framework for what we're going to talk about maybe on Thursday. So I'll see how much I can get through. So basically, why would I go away from one trap? Well, we've already seen if I want to tie DNA not, I want to do transcription studies, I want to look at actual myosin, I need to hold a molecule between two beads. What about more traps? Why would I not need to do that? Well, if I'm interested in colloidal physics, then this is actually very, very exciting and important. Why is that? What is colloidal physics? Well, if we go back to Nobel Prize winning Perry in the 1920s, colloids are beautiful atoms. In other words, we are interested in what happens in the atomic world. How does a superconductor work? How, does, how do particles arrange themselves in certain lattices? What are the interactions between lattices? How do all these things actually um, affect what we see? Typically, it's hard to image single atoms in crystals. It's just hard. And what it's doing. Incredibly, though, colloids can have an equated thermodynamic temperature. And they can be mono-dispersed. In other words, you can buy in the shops, basically, loads of colloids that are all the same size and specification. We can do surface chemistry. We can play with the solvents. And all these parameters can mediate the interaction in a controllable way. Now we use video tracking. I can track the motion of single colloids very easily. It's pretty straightforward. So what I can do is make pretend optical si uh, colloidal systems that mimic atomic systems but get single particle trajectories out, which means I can understand atomic physics at scale levels orders of magnitude higher. All right, and that's why colloid science is interesting. a huge area, and which is why people need lots of particles at lots of different positions. Very, very rich and exciting area, and you can look at competition between electrostatic effects, chemical effects, silver mediated, and the optical field. What can we? What else can we do? Well. We don't need to just create arrays in 2 and 3D. We can look at rotation, which Alina will cover, so I'm just going to skip over that sort of thing. She's going to tell you about how we can apply torques and do one of them, wonderful things with that. We can actually do cell organization in 2 and 3D. Incredibly, if you want to create 
uh, one of the beautiful things about colloidal cell biology is template assisted nucleation. In other words, creating small nuclei of objects and then seeing how tissue or other particles grow around them. Can you create templates to grow, for example, atomic crystals or other particles? These sorts of things can be done. We can look at interactions um, between particles. Now, all of these spots, the generally accepted phrase is a potential energy landscape. All right? so in other words, it could be an array of spots, it could be a special beam, it could be anything. A beautiful other things that are emerging now are single droplet reactions, creating arrays of particles, and so on. Um, now, all this ultimately relies on shaping your light beam and sculpting it. And sculpting your beam is actually very, very interesting. I guess the topic you haven't heard about here is sub-diffraction imaging. Incredibly, light, we can actually now, essentially, well, over, I'll say overcome the diffraction limit and get microscopy going down to nanometric size. Again, using beam shape. A good example of that is STEP. Um, which is done by Stefan Hell, which is stimulated time and region depletion microscopy. Some of you have also probably heard of structured illumination microscopy, perhaps. The good stuff is who's not who's heard of any of those things? Oh, two people. Right, okay. <laughs> Alright? So structured illumination is rather like moiré fringes. If you're ever on a train going past a set of railings, you remember those and you see those big fringes? It's really getting some structure you can't see putting on another structure you can't see, getting a big structure you can see, and then inferring back what you've got. That's a little nutshell. That's a very good, quick, cheap and cheerful way of describing it, right? And it's beautiful physics. So we can think the diffraction. So beam shaping, generally, is a huge area and used in many guises, and it's got a lot of potential. I'm just going to be able to show you some things in there. So how do I create a lot of traps? Well, I could buy a lot of lasers. Well, that's a bit silly. Okay, so I can buy a laser, but then I need to split it between everything I want to trap, right? Now I can split it in two ways. I can time share the beam, or I can actually fan out the beam. More. What does that mean? Well, time sharing, how, what does that mean? It means it traps me, then it traps I, then it traps me, da 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 goes around and then comes back to me. Well, you might think, well, that's a bit silly, because I probably want to move by the time it comes back to me. I would, but why, can't, why is that okay? Because the system's overdamped. Remember, the Einstein diffusion distance, square root 2 dt, all right, an object, especially about this big me, is really, really, well, I'm not going to go very far away, and I can uh, time share the beam really fast. So by the time it comes back to me, I'm hardly gone anyway. So as far as I'm concerned, I was trapped all the time. Okay? That's how you do it. Now, there's a number of ways you can do this. You can use galvanometer mirrors, piezo-driven mirrors, electro-optic devices. And the most popular one, and the one used probably for most biophysics experiments, even two traps onwards, has been the acoustic optic deflector, which is creating a sound grating by sound and um, deflecting the light in. Okay, so here, place the position of the conjugate mirror. Okay, and they experience a time average potential. So here's, here's two examples of that. So on the left is my name written with optical tweezers. Um, as you can see, my name is actually an anagram, or a word job, I don't know what you call it here, um, of Ashton, which is a bit spooky. There's only two women by getting influenced. But that, now, those look like they're all trapped all the time, don't they? They're not. They're time shared. The beam's going around all of them and then coming back. All right, with the RARA synthesizer, we can just program it and say, trap this, trap that. What are we seeing on the right? Just to give you an example of something more completely different, this is from David Marr's group. David Marr is a uh, working with diode lasers and in microfluidics largely. And what he's doing there is with acoustic-optic trapping, creating a little pump. All right, he's spinning these little objects here and creating a pump the size of a heart valve from colloidal particles. There's no microfabrication here. And there's no video. There we go. And the two little particles are being pumped around. Okay, and at the end of the day, he turns off the beams and the particles will just flow away. All right? So you can see it's pretty fast, and, can be, and what it can do. Now, I think Alina will talk maybe a little bit about pumping and things, and, and in a slightly different way, but these are two acousto-optic ways of doing it. Now, acousto-optics is great if I want to do lateral deflection, but as many of you know, it becomes incredibly complex if I want to get some kind of 3D. I can't easily get a lens function in there, so I can maybe trap above and below a given plane. Also, the diffraction efficiency is a function of angle, 
I need two AODs, and AOD is typically about 40%, so I'm going to do 16% efficiency typically, but they can handle the power, as we all know. Um, so there's pros and cons, they're very, very good, and very, very useful, so don't knock it, it's a really, really nice thing to, to use. <clears throat> so how many beats can we track? Well, it depends on the size of the beat, but here's how you do it. It's rather like Superman trying to spin plates. I don't know if anybody's had a go spinning plates here, ever. Uh, I can do quite with that two or three. But if you're, if you're Superman, you can probably do a lot, but even he'd have a limit, right? And it's the same with time chair traps. So imagine each of those is a trap. How do you work out from the physics how, how far a particle would go? The Einstein diffusion, Einstein's work in Brownian motion is some of his most powerful stuff. In some ways, we all hear about his work in relativity, but he made an amazing impact in Brownian dynamics. Okay? So, in that relation, and we take the diffusion constant in water with a certain viscosity, let's suppose we were, we were the, beam, the beam took 25 microseconds to get back to me. That's not a long time to do it. Either. But even 25 microseconds, I'd have, uh, if I was this one micron beam, I'd have gone 5 nanometers. Now, you might say five nanometers isn't much, but if you're doing a single molecule experiment, you might worry about that. Okay, so those, those are the of calculations you should do as a, as a sort of back of the end of it ones to try and work out what's a, how far your particle might drift in that given time period. So with the laser and the wave, the beams will stray. Um, here's a little diagram of the, the trap, and I just put this in for two reasons. <laughs> so this is just this, two things. One is to show you uh, where you put this, these optics to give you an idea. There's some amazing, really nice and sensible optics that goes in here, which I won't have time to talk about. Here's your system for deflecting the beam. And then you have relay optics. Now you might think, why, why do I need that? I don't really need more lenses. But what you do is you create optical conjugates. And the idea here is that you basically mirror or image the back of the objective to a certain point, which means basically, imagine my finger and thumb are the back aperture. It means every time the beam comes through, it does this. But it never misses that hole. OK, that's the back aperture. And that's really what it is. And it's optical conjugates. I can go into a little bit more detail later. But, uh, Use the time over. It's a very nice thing. It's actually used in all scanning geometry for confocal, multifocal, microscope. So bear that in mind. Anyway, here are the four main uh, systems for time shift trapping. What I've done is just given you an idea of the typical switching rates, the typical efficiency you might be able to get. That's a single one. The angular deflection that you can get, and some kind of resolution. Okay, so at the moment, AOD seems to be the most powerful. Galvo mirrors and Gesso mirrors are relatively slow, but okay for, say, two traps. And EODs are very good, they're very fast, but the deflection range of these electro optic devices can be small. So these are things you might want to consider when you're purchasing or buying a system for this. Okay? And that's the conjugate optics that we want to use. Now, yeah, what I'll do is I think I'll just introduce the phase only optic and the two beams and then we'll stop there for today. What if I don't want to time shift? I want to trap a lot of particles at the same time. And also, not only do I want to just create a spot, but I want to change the phase, okay, as well as the amplitude. I want to create, I want to have more freedom over what I do to beam shape. Right. So now we move away from the objects I've described so far. So here's the beam going into the microscope project. Remember it's not missing, because I've got this clever sort of optical conjugate so I can keep doing this. The beam's always coming in at an angle that doesn't have the back aperture. Right. If I take the beam from the centre and I move it a bit to the left to create a trap, that means the beam comes in at an angle. That is equivalent to me putting the beam straight on and sticking a little prism at the back of the objective. Now, I'm not suggesting you go away and stick a prism at the back of the objective. See, that's a little bit silly. A is very fiddly. And you have a different prism for each trap. But you can see that that is equivalent to a phase retardation. All right? That's a very important word. Okay? So what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need an optical device where ideally I could play with the phase and the amplitude if I wanted, so that I could basically steer the beam around. So if I take some of my beam 
and somehow imposed a prism function or some sort of maths to give me a deflection, then some of the beam will be split. And this will be not time shared, it will be split at the same time that there's a zero form of straight through beam going through. Okay, so how do we do that? We use a device that's becoming ever more uh, ubiquitous. I don't know if Helena's bought one yet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, they've got one now. <laughs> I think they were one of the groups that resisted for a wee while, but uh, they've got all the bits of the bullets in the two. These are very, very ubiquitous. So when I started optical tweezers, it took me about a year to get four holograms for four beams, because I was interested in the uh, things that Helena will describe um, with Gauss and Gerby. Okay, it took me a year for uh, a university in Germany made these beautiful devices that were sculpted and being formed. When we bought one of these, we made 200 holograms in a week. <laughs> like just sit there with a, with a laptop and just play it, get it wrong and try it again. So it's really very, very nice. In fact, uh, this year in St. Andrews, we're starting an undergraduate program to have SLMs in the undergraduate lab because they're so versatile. You can click a beam and do transverse laser mode, you can do some optical tweezers, you can do something. They're really nice and useful. What are they? Right. Basically, they are an array of liquid crystal droplets. Um, I don't want to be talking about tweezers in liquid crystals, I think, this week, but probably be completely different to this. They're liquid crystal droplets that we can either electrically or optically address. Okay? So basically, the easiest way to think about it is if I give you a piece of glass, and I make one side super flat, and the other one I can do this. Okay, I can mold a bit of glass as I like. Okay? By my hand. Okay? Right? Imagine that. And I can do that electrically or optically. Most are now electrical, and they're systems such as they're based on a silicon base. And what happens is they can be in transmission or reflection, and basically most of them are now in reflection. Light comes in, light comes off, and basically it lends, it lends sorry about the color, um, forms a Fourier transform, so I can compute what I would need, function I need to put on this liquid crystal array. Okay, so that the incident waveform is actually diffracted into a waveform I like. In other words, it's computer-generated holography. And we're so clever these days, you don't even need holograms, you probably think you need a reference and, a, and your object. Okay, well, we know what we want as the end product, the pattern of our choice. All right. What I can do is I can actually compute backwards and work out what the Fourier transform is such that I get that. Okay? So this means I can do anything I like within reason. These devices are now becoming more popular and actually can take a lot higher power. We have 14 of them in our group. In fact, we were, I think, Hamamatsu's biggest customer. In fact, we're so big that the general manager actually came up to see us to understand why we bought so many. Which I thought was very odd for a company to go <laughs> selling devices. We use these not only in optical tweezers, but in bio, biology, etc. They're used in, in numerous applications. And to be honest, they're no more than wherever it is in the data trajectory is in this point. Uh, oh, there it is, yeah. So it's essentially what's in that, in that box up there with a few extra, uh, extra gizmos like okay? And they're pretty small, all right? And they're around $10,000, around $15,000 Australian dollars, something like that. Maybe more. A little bit more maths for those of you interested, because I just wanted to point out two things. Right. So let's think of the two simplest things you might want to do. There's obviously more clever things. One is to do what I did with my AOD, right? Just go around the room. Okay? So get that deflection angle. Now, how would you do that if, I, if you wanted to do it? Well, hopefully most of you say grating could do that for me, all right? With the increased number of eyes giving me an increased deflection. Right, what's the other thing that I want to do but I couldn't do with the AOD? Well, in the AOD, I was stuck in the plane. What I really like to do is zoom in and out. All right? I need a lens. What does a lens do? It adds a quadratic phase function. Right? There's a quadratic Alright? So those are the only two things. I need a lens function to go in and out, and a grating function to go in and out. If I add all those together, I should be able to do more or less spots in any 3D arrangement. Okay, of course I've got constraints in my optics and so forth, but that should give me a great start. So in fact, that's exactly what you do. So here you have the system, that's your linear phase modulation, that's the quadratic in and out. Add them together, modulate two by, you get all these weird and wonderful shapes. It's essentially allow you to do what you want. That's your starting point. We can do a lot more. So how much time have I got? Not too much time. Five minutes, okay. Alright. Right. Okay. Right. 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 
as usual, I'm fast and overestimate the amount of things that are in them that I'd like to tell you about. So let's watch a video of the things you can do. So there's thousands of videos of many groups. That, um, so these are, you see they have different planes immediately, okay? All right, you see the brownie motion, some of them came in and out. You can play around and focus and do what you like. Right, so the beauty here is I can keep them in different planes, I can power time share, I can power share, I can do one load of wonderful things. Alright? So what I'll do is I'll just start by introducing some of the, the talking, some of this you'll hear about, but I just wanted to make comments on two things before I continue. So these beams will largely be covered by Helena, so I won't say too much about them. But instead of just creating spots and going in and out, I might want to do an other more elaborate thing. Now, the propagation of light in itself has become very, very exciting and interesting. Many of you have heard of things like metamaterials, so understanding of electromagnetism is actually undergoing a semi-revolution of light. Even far-field optics, people are thinking about applying things and doing things in strange and wonderful ways. And these beings, which uh, I'll we'll briefly touch upon, have Orbitary angular momentum, which we'll hear about in Lena's work, but there are other beams that it can actually uh, undergo limited diffraction. You can also make light beams that go around corners. So light doesn't always travel in straight lines. But these are all things that one should actually think about um, as we go forward. So I think uh, now I think I'm gonna maybe I'll stop there. And, uh, same question. So in my next lecture, I'll show you how certain light beams can be used in applications, and then we'll go on to advanced it. So I hope in that lecture I've given the idea of precision measurements and also how we can sculpt or shape our light beam. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we're doing a tracking for the part that's care about the polarization of the track. 
Yeah, that's an excellent question. So uh, the, uh, the short answer is yes. Yes, polarization can have an effect because, of course, polarization will dictate the transmission of my objective and my dielectric mirrors. It will also, depending on the polarization of the focus, it will dictate the Fresnel equations as well for the light scattering and transmission. So, yes. Typically, though, most people don't worry too much about it because you do your experiment and you calibrate backwards. In other words, I work out what my track frequency is before and I see it. Polarization is an important issue for things that Lena, I think, will describe. And she may or may not, I don't know if she will touch on it, but her group and others have, have looked at the polarization effects of breakup of beams that can actually change the shape of beams and also interchange of angular momentum, which I'm not sure she would discuss because they've done that with that very important thing. So, yes. So, and when you're asking when you're talking about medical particles, or metal particles? Metal particles, yeah. Yeah, is it similar to what you're asking here? You're talking about trapping on the wall? Yes. It's the same. So, for polarization? Yeah. So that's a good question. So polarization, yes, will have an effect on gold particles as well. Um, I guess probably it's maybe a little bit less of an effect than dielectric particles, feasibility and treatment. But when I have to go and look at how plasma resonance might change the interaction with for a small gold particle as a function of polarization. But yes, there will be a polarization dependent effect because you're exciting a plasma resonance. If you're near there, if you're far away. Then it's just a scattering criteria. It depends how close you are to the resonance, I guess, depending on the strong problem of polarization. Yeah. Uh, so with uh, what level of fatality does an acetylene uh, uh, retain diffraction limited nature of the beam? So the question is, what sort of fidelity, I'll just repeat it, oh, does, uh, does the SLM retain the um, diffraction limited nature of the Okay, so if I may rephrase that, just correct me if I misunderstand your question, so please stop me. You're saying the SLM is not going to be perfectly flat, probably. It's going to introduce some aberrations, all right? Yeah. And does that, do I worry about that when I do an experiment like that or somebody else? Okay, yes, you do. So. Um, until probably one year ago, most SLMs were actually really very rough. And so most people used the Max Ender interferometer to work out what their surface flatness was. But beautifully, in these you can apply Zernicke polynomial functions to remove any residual errors in the SLM. So that's something one would do before you do that. I think there's an SLM, I don't want to advertise one or against the other, but there's one from the US recently that's incredibly flat. She said that. So this holder nonlinear <laughs> optics is so a very, very flat SLM, which actually gives you, which retains it. But essentially, if you do a simple max end and work out the flatness of your SLM, you can add, just in the same way I did the quadratic function and the lens function, the appropriate polynomial to take out these. So, so long as the aberrations aren't very large, and most of them are low frequency aberrations, it's not really a limiting case. And I was, um, in fact, in work I won't describe here, we've just beaten the airy limit by a factor of three just using this. But I think uh, Raphael might be thinking about this area. I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, you, you can do it. It's not a limitation, it's a very, very good point. But you don't just stick the SLM in turn and play press go. You do need to worry about its flatness, yes. If that can cause other issues. All right. Well, I think we'll stop here.